Welcome to worship on this third Sunday after the Epiphany as we look at callings from God. And our text is the Mark's account of Jesus calling his first disciples. It's said that life happens when we're making other plans. And so sometimes we may feel the call of God when someone asks us to do something or bring our gifts to bear on a challenge that we may not feel cut out for. And so it may even feel like an interruption and not especially a call from God as we usually expect it to feel. Invitations from God usually come in that way. But know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here to consider God's invitations and maybe even God's calling. Our opening verse this week comes from a poem in a collection by Ted Loder called Gorillas of Grace. And after this week of new beginnings at the Capitol and elsewhere, I'm reading the closing verse of a longer poem of his entitled Help Me to Believe in Beginnings. Help me to believe in beginnings, to make a beginning, to be a beginning, so that I may not just grow old, but grow new each day of this wild, amazing life you call me to live with the passion of Jesus Christ. Let us begin with a few moments of silence as we recall the presence of God. Please join me in our opening prayer. Loving God, we pause in the stillness of this day to rest and quiet ourselves so that we can feel what stirs within us. Each breath draws us closer to the pulse of life, and with each exhalation, we make room for something new. May we find in this gathering the comfort of those who care and the gratitude of being in community. May we encounter patience along our growing edges and compassion in our most tender spots. Here in this place, may we find the inspiration and encouragement we need to face our challenges 
and to nurture ourselves. And in this time of turning, may we remember to practice kindness and act with integrity in the hope that the light of our actions may travel like that of faraway stars. Amen. Now I invite you to a time of sharing God's peace with one another. And I do hope that you feel a sense of peace this morning. I want to invite the kids to come a little closer to the screen if you're in the room and also to invite each of the adults to get in touch with that unvarnished view of the world that children often have. And I want to show you a picture of Jesus calling the fishing disciples, or at least two of them. It was uh, Peter, James, John and um, Andrew that were the first four Jesus called. So I want to ask, which of you knows the story that goes with this sculpture? I mean, that's actually what it is. It looks like a live action something, but it's really a piece of art in the courtyard of a real church in the Philippines. Do these guys look kind of busy? Yeah, they're fishing. And it looks like they're pulling fish out of the water. So why would Jesus be interrupting them at work? I mean, your parents don't want you to interrupt them when they're doing something important. And this was how they made their living. I mean, couldn't Jesus wait until after they were done? Look at the picture. See the expressions on their faces. See what their bodies are doing. And I wonder sometimes if Jesus interrupts you when you're doing something important. Does that ever happen? Does God show up sometimes when you're doing other things? Listen in a few moments when the story is read from the Bible and listen for when Jesus says, follow me and I will make you catch or fish for people. Maybe you fish or maybe you skateboard or maybe you like to build with Legos or cook or bake or read to someone else out loud. These are important things. But I wonder if Jesus might ask you someday to do that thing that you do, and when you do it, follow him, because it helps somebody else or you, and you think of Jesus as you do it. I wonder about that. Don't you? Will you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus, for all the things that we do in work or play and for how they remind us that you love us and that you're with us. Amen. Today's reading is from Mark 1, verses 14 through 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into, into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. 
and immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Here ends the reading. One of the things that we notice if we read Mark's gospel for even a few verses is its haste. Mark uses the word immediately 40 times in 16 chapters. The book begins abruptly, as though Mark doesn't expect to be able to get it all out before something happens to him. And once they're called, the disciples are constantly on the move with Jesus, constantly doing things and covering miles of ground and changing lives relentlessly, it seems, through healings or words or casting out a demon or inviting people to follow. It's relentless. And more than that, the calling of the disciples and their response seem impulsive and poorly thought out, as though they didn't even think at all, as though Jesus is willing to just take about anybody who will follow him immediately. Jesus doesn't advertise, vet, or otherwise deliberate when he's calling these four fishermen. And they don't ask any questions either. Nothing about work hours or pay or even what the job description is. Not a very auspicious way to inaugurate the mission of the reign of God. And yet Jesus recognizes a willingness in them to follow him when he calls. On the surface, at least, this seems kind of counterintuitive. I mean, in our congregation, as with most UCC congregations, we value discernment and process. The process that leads up to making a decision. And we make sure to do our homework and not be impulsive. To look at all the angles, consider the risks as well as the benefits. Thinking things through and seeking the will of God and the leadings of the Spirit together in as much as we can discern those things. At times, we can seem like Treebeard, the Ent, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And I think he appears in the second or the third part of the trilogy, certainly in the third part of the trilogy, in the face of Sauron's evil takeover and the impending destruction of Middle-earth, Treebeard puts the brakes on and tells the hobbit named Mary, now let's not be hasty. Discernment and deliberation are things I value about our church because we believe that in many cases, more is yet to be revealed by God through prayer or through research or through conversations. But you know, in the past year, we've had to act fast, too, placing matters in God's hands in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. We had to respond very quickly. The opening chapters of Mark's gospel provide a rationale for action, not for endless deliberation. Leave that to some of the other books in the Bible. What we see is a right then and there quality at work in Jesus' ministry. Nothing matters except the present and what one does with it. Yes, it is informed by the ultimate goal of gathering together a new community of people who are going to witness to the love of God in real and amazing ways, and it's tied to God's faithfulness in the past. But in Mark, more than any of the other Gospels, we see the power of now at work. The whole point in Jesus' time was that the world was changing, just as it is now for us. Roman rule had split up the Jewish community into factions under the pressure of the choice between worshiping the God of Abraham and worshiping the emperor, Caesar. Empire and its influences, its pressures, were dissolving the bonds of kinship and spirituality in exchange for the promise of power and material prosperity. I mean, it's that age-old struggle, and it was happening then. 
and the exaltation of the individual over the cohesiveness of communities was reshaping the entire orientation of Jewish society. Their world was rocked. The world was ripe for change, though, renewing the call to shalom, justice, wholeness, and community motivated by the God of Israel. That's why there was no time to waste. Right then and there has three qualities that change everything, and we're going to explore these qualities briefly. First of all, it's more immediate than it is deliberate. Second, it values willingness over giftedness. And third, it values practice over perfection. Our world is changing. Right then and there has become right now and here as each of us figures out what our role is and what to do next, whether it's in a nation ripe for change or a congregation seeking to be agile and responsive to God's promptings and the circumstances of everyday life. To respond to Jesus' invitation to life in this time of change, together we need a right then and there approach to life. So let's explore the first posture. It's immediate more than deliberate. While there is a time for searching and researching, weighing and carefully deciding by consensus on the best course of action, when the time is right, you and I need to be ready to say yes and follow an invitation, a hunch, or an intuitive pull or push before we've had time sometimes adequately to consider or evaluate or find reasons not to do it. In other words, before we can talk ourselves out of it, when it's clear what the right action is, we need to plunge right in. There's a saying of Victor Hugo's, nothing is so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Moving all of doing church from in-person to virtual last March is an example. The same thing goes for those moments when someone asks us to pray for them. For example, we promise to pray for them when a loved one is sick or they're facing a big decision in their lives. When we say, I'll pray for you, we toss it off almost thoughtlessly because that's what good Christian people are supposed to do, right? But then what happens? We forget to pray. And part of the reason if we, do th we forget is because we promised to do it, but we promised to do it later, and we said, I'll get to it. Better that we stop right then and there and maybe pray with or for them on the spot so we don't forget. And this may just be a matter of holding their hands or being in their presence and say, let's pray. And maybe you end up don't having any, not having any words, but you hold that silence, just the two of you in the presence of God. Or you might do like I do, pray constantly throughout the day for people who come into your mind so that one request can enter the stream and be held before God. I mean, we turn good intentions into actions when we do this immediately, before we forget or before we think of reasons not to do it. And even after due deliberation, we still have to act. I mean, the Indigo Girls song, Hammer and a Nail, practically the 1990s anthem of the Habitat for Humanity movement, has a line in it that says, my life is more than a vision. The sweetest part is acting after making a decision. The second posture is valuing willingness over giftedness. I think that sometimes talent, aptitude, and giftedness are an asset, and other, th other times I think they're highly overrated because sometimes we use our lack of a particular gift in order to disqualify ourselves from responding to a calling that's coming from God in our life. Using what we have is more important than what we have or don't have. And often, if we get started by using whatever it is that we have, we learn as we go. We make the path by walking. I mean, that's what we did when we switched from in-person to virtual worship. We had two days to get together a live stream, but we did it. Sometimes, um, as 
uh, Leonard Bernstein was fond of saying, sometimes the only thing that's required for good art to happen is a good idea and not enough time. Never discount the role that pressure can play on something amazing coming into being. I want to tell you a story that kind of illustrates what I'm talking about, or maybe the downside of not recognizing what one has. There was an old man who had lived in the rundown house on the block in a neighborhood for longer than anyone could remember. Maybe you know somebody like this. It was rumored that he had claimed squatter's rights years ago, and the legal owners had never contested his claim. From time to time, he shuffled about the neighborhood, pushing a wobbly grocery cart as he searched for discarded treasures. Regardless of the season, he always wore the same tattered clothing. When weeks had passed without a sign of him anywhere, someone called the police to file a missing persons report. And upon investigating, the officers discovered his cold, lifeless body, dead. According to the coroner, he had died of starvation. After the old man's death, nearby residents petitioned the city to demolish the unsightly house where he lived for so long. The official records were searched, and they actually discovered that he wasn't a squatter after all. He had purchased the house and owned it free and clear. No mortgage. He paid that off years ago. But no heirs of his could be identified and located, so the demolition order went, up, went forward as it was given. As workers began to dismantle the house, they were startled to find the oddest form of insulation in the walls. And I use insulation kind of like um, with quotes around it because it wasn't really good insulation. It was under the floors and crammed into the nooks and crevices throughout the structure. But you know what it was? It was authentic stock certificates and other securities that turned out to be worth millions of dollars. Turns out this reclusive man who had lived in abject poverty for years actually had great riches. He was wealthy. And although he could have afforded the finest food, he ended up starving to death. As a book on stewardship that I've read puts it, worth is gained in what we use, not in what we hold. The final posture that I think helps us to glimpse what is important in terms of responding quickly is that whatever gift we choose, it develops as soon as we begin to use it. So this one is called practice over perfection. Remember what I just said about we make the path by walking? We may know just enough of something to get started on it, but we have to learn as we go. In one of my favorite books on writing, Bird by Bird, the author Anne Lamott suggests that perfectionism is the voice of the oppressor, the enemy of the people. It will keep you cramped and insane your whole life. I think perfectionism is based on the obsessive belief that if you run carefully enough, hitting each stepping stone just right, you won't have to die. The truth is that you will die anyway and that a lot of people who aren't even looking at their feet are going to do it a lot better than you and especially have a lot more fun while they're doing it. Any of us who refuse to begin moving forward because we're not good enough, don't know enough, or are afraid of not doing a good enough job need to take a cue from the disciples, particularly the disciples in Mark. They were far from perfect, and they usually didn't get what Jesus was trying to express to them until long after the cross and resurrection. And yet they moved forward in the absence of certain knowing. In their case, practice may not have made their faith perfect, but it made faithful response possible. Right then and there, and right now and here, in the church as it has developed in the millennia since then. May it be so for us as well. Amen.
eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, mother and father of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. May the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. In our announcements this morning, I have three. I know that's a lot, but um, our first virtual annual congregational meeting ever is next Sunday at 1130 on Zoom. Hard copy packets are going to be mailed out, but all you need, including documents and the Zoom link, are in the big blue box in Thursday's tab. We also have three Kindle Fire tablets available for loan if you want to participate online but don't have the technology. These are devices that you can use to participate in the meeting, or you can simply call in to participate via your phone and get the audio portion of it and be able to speak with others in the meeting. Please join us. We want to make this the most inclusive annual meeting ever. Our second announcement is a reminder that Isaiah's We Make Minnesota virtual launch, uh, getting ready for the 2021 legislative season. Um, is today from 2 to 5 p.m. on Zoom. It's free of charge, but you need to register to get the link, and that's in Thursday's tab, the registration link is. So do it right after the service this morning. Each of us can claim our agency to build a multiracial democracy and a caring economy in Minnesota, and this event is the first step to find out how. And finally, have you given to RIP medical debt yet? This is our mission, our giving mission, through online giving or um, mailing in checks to clear debt in Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, and South Dakota between now and Valentine's Day through our joint mission project with RIP Medical Debt, a nonprofit, and St. Anthony Park UCC. Our goal is to raise $15,000 in order to clear $1.5 million of medical debt. Go to our homepage on the website and click on the button there to give. Because debt gets bought on the discount market. Yeah, that's a thing. Every dollar that we raise goes to clear $100 worth of medical debt. We give to remind ourselves of how many gifts we have to offer and to remember that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. We give with the faith that together we have enough to affect real change in our world. For all that we have and all that we are able to do, we thank you, God. Christ has come and sets us free. Sing and praise Him, sing and praise Him. Oh, 
Let us pray together our closing prayer. May all our gifts given to ministries of grace be a blessing to friends and strangers, those like us and those not, those deserving and those not. For in this way, O oh God, your love reaches all of your beloved. Amen.